right. I hope everyone's doing all right and everybody's had a great summer. Um, I know, uh, I, I think our, talking to our coaching staff, uh, uh, it, they've had a great summer, opportunity to spend some family time and, and enjoy some time with their family, but I know everybody's excited to get back out there on the field uh, and start playing. Um, you know, I, I know Coach Savage and his staff has worked really hard. Our, our players have worked hard to uh, develop their bodies and prepare themselves physically and mentally for training camp coming up here to get us going. Uh, the uh, we got we got some pretty good news uh, from the NCAA on on Trey and Van uh, that they're going to clear them to be eligible to play. So we're excited uh, right now to uh, know know that we're going to have Trey with us. I know we're still working with the uh, the SEC office uh, with uh, you know to find a get a final resolve with the Van Jefferson situation, but. Um, the, um, uh, uh, it's, you know, everything through the NCAA has been very positive. I think, uh, you know, our, our administration, Jamie McCluskey, his whole crew did a, a fabulous job working with it, uh, following all the, the, the steps and doing things the right way. And, and it's great for both those two young men and student athletes that have worked their tail off, uh, since they've been here to get ready for this football season and not let that be a distraction, whether it be in the classroom or on the field within their preparation. So, uh, it's an exciting time to be a, to be a Gator. I'm excited to get out there. Uh, can't wait for the the, the first game. And uh, you know, I mean, I I've bless you. I've been feeling for uh, the uh, feeling the excitement off off of all of our fan base everywhere. And uh, you know, I mean, that's you, you go back. I know they start putting out all the hype videos. I do watch the hype videos, and uh, they get me hyped watching, you know, all the great moments uh, in the past in the swamp, and um, some that some that were here before me, some that I were, were a part of, some that came after me, and uh, gets me excited for the future moments and the great moments that are going to be happening here in the swamp uh, this season and in years to come. So uh, we're ready to get it kicked off and get going. Questions. I'll get this out of the way. Have you talked to uh, Coach Meyer, your thoughts on his situation at uh, Ohio State? You know what? I, I, I haven't. I sent him a text last night just, just saying, uh, you know, he and the family were, were in our prayers because I know uh, we, we've been very close. Um, I haven't gotten to see uh, a lot or, or research much. I've just seen a couple of the headlines here and there because we're, we're getting ready for, for training camp right now. So, um, but, uh, but I know, um, you know, I mean, he – very, very close. Uh, he and, and the family are, are, are very close to my family. And uh, so, you know, our, our, our prayers are with them as they go through all of this. Yeah, I, you know what? I, don't, I haven't seen enough of it to, to really to know. You know, I mean, I, 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 if it was, I, I guess, something I, I, one of these days I'm going to sit down and try to read everything, get all the information and, and find it. Um, you know, what's in there? I mean, in just any of those, anything that happens with those type of incidents are, are, are you know, so difficult. You know, anytime there, there are, are domestic problems with, with anybody in the world. I mean, it's, um, it, it, it's a sad situation. Um, and so I think that, that um, having to deal with it, I mean, I'll, I'll look. I want to, one day I'd like to gather information and see, you know, if there's a, a way... Um, of which to handle it better, or how it, how it was handled, or what went on, and how to research it, and how to how to uh, prepare yourself if if you're ever if that type of situation ever arises for me. Not not to hijack the press conference or the subject, but I know that when you were here early on with Urban, there was a pretty strict code about certain things respecting women, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera mm -hmm. no guns, et cetera. Just out of curiosity, what is the policy here on the Mellon era regarding domestic? violence regarding respect for women, et cetera? Well, I, it's very similar um, to what it was, you know, I mean, uh, that we believe in all that way, you know, I mean, uh, one of the things, um, you know, I mean, domestic violence is not something, uh, it's something that, that is a problem, something that has to be taken very seriously, uh, not just in today's world, should always be taken seriously, but I think it's come more to the forefront uh, in today's world, uh, become more of a public issue. But um, one of the things, anytime I deal with discipline, anytime I deal with any of those issues, um, it, and and I guess it's hard in because we live in such an immediate society, we need to know everything immediately. Um, one of the things I always try to do before I, I make any decision is try to gather uh, as much information 
that I can before making decisions uh, so that I, I, I think when you do make decisions, the more information you have, the better decision you can make um, on, on situations that have, that have effect on people's lives. And one more, I know that you, uh, you obviously have been involved with the wives, et cetera, all coaching staffs have. Shelly, I'm very involved with Urban. Uh, Megan, in her role, I'm sure is involved. How is she involved in that regard? And do, do you consult with her about it? I do, you know, I mean, I, I, you're, you're co the, uh, Megan's very, very involved in a, in a lot of our program, involved in the players' lives, involving, helping the players deal with situations. Um, you know, I mean, there's, yeah, there's, there's so many different situations you deal with a, as a coach. Um, and, you know, Megan's very, very involved in it. Um, you know, whether it's, it's dealing with um, hard situations uh, that, that Urban's dealing with, with, with people on your staff, or whether it's dealing with having to tell a young man his mom just passed away from cancer, um, right? Or whether it's, uh, you know, uh, dealing with any number of situations. She's very involved. Um, you know, our coaches' wives are very involved. You know, we, we put a lot into football. We put a lot into our players, put a lot into the development of, of these young men. Uh, and, and a lot of times they become family members, uh, you know, like family members to you. And so, uh, you know, that they're very close with uh, the wives, with, with, you know, with my kids, with all of those things. And so, um, you know, the, the wives are a very important part of the program uh, and an important support system. I know you wanted to have a clean summer, uh, and obviously there was a couple of things that came out late, well, recently. Um, how disappointing is that, and do you know of any other suspensions uh, uh, going forward? Yeah, well, obviously, you know, I, I, one of the things we deal with as a head coach is, is uh, trying to help young men make good decisions. That's a never-ending process, you know, and that, that's one. Um, and from my first team meeting, uh, through a team meeting we had last night, we continually talk about decision making in every aspect of your life and the consequences that your decisions have. And um, you know, we we have we have we have you know on the football team we'll have 110 uh, young men coming to training camp. You know, I think between the ages of 17 and 23 years old. Uh, you know, and and part of our job not just to coach football but to help educate them and teach them how to make good decisions in life. So that never ends uh, for us. You know, um, as far as a suspension and discipline, there's, um, you know, we, we try to look at each case independently and separately. If there are going to be, you know, uh, there, there's some discipline that, you know, honestly, we, a lot of time law enforcement takes care of it and the, the legal process takes care of it. A lot of time the university takes care of it. Um, and there's some things that we take care of and when we take care of it, uh, some are public, some are private. Um, but it's something we take very, very seriously, the discipline within the program. Uh, as, as far as suspensions or any suspensions, that's something that I've done in the past. Um, you know, we'll, we'll let you know if there'll be suspensions. Usually we do it on, on game day. I mean, not like two minutes before kickoff, but that morning uh, we'll, we kind of let everybody know, hey, this is, these, these are guys that are going to be suspended for any numerous uh, number of things, but but discipline something I I take very very seriously in the program, and um, but discipline also involves a lot of education for the players and, and teaching them how to make good decisions in life. You know, on the discipline issue, again, the the incident that happened with the the fight over on campus, a confrontation, and um, you know, seemingly guns involved, which it turned out not to be apparently. What, what the players, a couple said that they feel threatened as a kind of when they're out in groups or have they talked about this to you? I yeah, mean, we you taking we, precautions for, about stuff like this. To well, again, it gets to, de to decision making in them. You know, I mean, they get presented. Uh, um, I, I, I think one thing they have to understand at, at being a, a, a football player here at the University of Florida, you, you're a high profile person. People know who you are um, <laughs> as you walk around. And there's a lot of benefits to that um, of coming and it's uh, you know what I mean it, it's kind of a neat deal when you get to walk around and everyone you know you have a great game great game and people know who you are and a little bit of celebrity status I mean that that's fun for kids um, there also comes responsibility on the other side that that people um, might be jealous or have something against you and uh, 
you know, one of the things that we, we constantly tell them to do is, again, how to make good decisions, how to deal with those situations. You know, when to walk away. Just, just you know, we, we don't need to engage in this. We, just can, we can just walk away because um, it, it, it's not something they even need to be involved in. Uh, it's, it's one thing we discuss as a team. You know, help each other out. If you see a teammate that you think's not making a good decision or, or possibly doing something they shouldn't be doing, as a team, we stick together and get them on the right path. Uh, but, I, but I also think, you know, um, I have a little more experience maybe in my life than some of these guys do. I think a lot of you do. And, and they're, they're still young kids that are growing and developing. And so it's a constant education process for them on how to handle all, of, all the different situations you get yourself into. May I ask a football question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you have a timetable or an ideal one when it comes to the starting quarterback? I, I think I heard an interview where you said maybe after the first scrimmage, be great. I, I, but you know, I, I got this question from my that. wife. You know, you ask if Megan's involved in the program. <laughs> I got this question from her quite a bit, too. You're like, can we get this resolved? Can we have a starter that we feel good about going? I, I said, listen, I would love to get that done. I, that That's something to me that, that – uh, I want to feel comfortable with. I don't have the timetable because if, if I give myself a specific timetable, I don't know when we're going to be ready to make that decision. Uh, I hope it's, uh, I hope it's an e a clear-cut decision, um, you know, that, that we know this, this person is going to give us the best opportunity to win games and lead our, our program into the future. Uh, you know, part of me also, I have to make sure that, that we have one that, that we feel good as a starter, but you know, you're talking whoever our backup is, is also one play away from being the starter. So I hope I feel really good about that position and that situation as well. So I, I, I'd love to give you a timetable. I'd love to say on this date, we're going to know. Uh, I, I've learned through the years not to do that because I've thought in the past, I'm going to know the starter on this date. That date comes and I'm like, I thought this guy was going to be it in the last three days. He's been terrible. This other guy's been great. And, um, so I, I hope it, I hope it defines itself for us during training camp and the, and the team, everyone knows this is the guy that's going to help us win. Yeah, not, not to belabor events in Columbus, but mm -hmm. is this in some ways a, a reminder, a call to action that coaches know that coaching is about more than coaching at this level? The salary um, is high profile. I mean, your caretakers of integrity, character. I, mean, I, I do. I, I think, um, you know. I, I, I think all coaches know you're, you're held as a coach uh, in the public eye to a very, very high standard. Uh, and um, so I don't know that it's a wake-up call in that way. I, I think that if you ask most coaches at top programs around America, they understand they're, they're there. I, I don't know if you're going to find a coach that doesn't believe that, you know, their job as the head coach is to, you know, is to have a program that has and teaches young people character and integrity um, and how to become successful in life, not just being a, you know, a, a processing plant for football players. Um, I know certainly for me, that, that's why I coach. I, 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 I love winning football games. I hate the other thing. Um, but, you know, I, I, when I go to bed at night, I'm, I, that worries me, winning and losing because I'm so competitive. Um, but the fine when you sit down and, and you think about peace in your life, are you making a positive impact on young people's lives, which is a much more important role as a coach. Um, you know, I'd, I want to win every game we play. Chances are that's not going to happen. Um, you look at the last several national champions, it's still, that hasn't happened. Um, and, but as a coach... You look at the in lives you can impact. That's the most important thing. And so I, I, I think I certainly understand that as a coach. I, I would think most coaches and most people I know understand that as a coach, uh, that, you know, that's why you do it. That's why you coach, to help impact young people's lives. Uh, Dan, how difficult is it to uh, get a program, uh, a high-profile program like this one, out of a, out of a, what has been a significantly long rut for Florida, and how much will your experience at Mississippi State getting that program going help in that regard? Well, I, I think the one thing, you know, one of the things um, when I got to Mississippi State, 
uh, to build the program was, you know, and I, and I constantly talked about was it was building a cons consistency within the program, building a consistent winner. Uh, that you need to have that consistency. You know, the one the one thing that that is that that I'm I spent time looking at and still trying to figure out. Uh, might not even know as until the season gets on with our players and how they respond to every situation. Is you know, if you just even take the last, never mind the, the however, where everyone considers the rut may be. You know, if it started in 2010 or 11 or, or what year you might consider it after the, the championship run uh, for all those years. Uh, but I just look at it in the last four years where you have two four win seasons and two SEC East championships. Um, now there's, I, I'm sure if you go back and look at every single season, there's a, several defining moments that separate one from the other. But overall, the lack of consistency to me is something that really is glaring that you shouldn't have those massive swings. You know, I, I could see, hey, we're SEC champ, East champions competing in, in the title game one year. You know, and, and we had a rebuilding year that you won seven, eight games maybe another year. And, you know, that, but, but the massive swings that went on uh, is something I'm, I'm still trying to figure out not just within the program, within the players of how it goes and how to prevent that from happening and keep, you know, I, I want to build consistency within the program. Once we have consistency, we want to continually raise that consistency and raise that bar where we're consistently competing for championships every single year. And, and that's the challenge to building the program. You know, that, that's, that, I would say that's the biggest difference between this year's team and the Florida football program where it kind of... Uh, I guess the only way you could probably define it is, is over the last, in the rut, is everybody, there was a lot of concerns about each individual team and maybe not always investing the program as a whole. And, and uh, to me, that's one thing I learned is, is we got to invest, we got we want to win, trust me, I want to win with this year's team. Uh, I expect to compete for a championship with this year's team. But also I want to build a program which is even more important over the long term, that's a consistent winner and a consistently competing for championships. You talked a lot on your spring tour about summer kind of being where those quarterbacks really make the next jump, if they're going to take that jump. Uh, have you gotten any sense, I know you can't be around them a ton, just how much they've been able to get done during the summer? No, because I can't be around them. I'm, I'm excited to find out. Uh, we'll find out tomorrow, you know, uh, a little bit, and then we'll find out a little bit more as time goes on, the more and more we put in uh, to the system, we'll find out, uh, you know, who's put, who's put the real time in. Um, you know, and I'd love it if, if all of them have. And it is a heated battle that way. And, but, uh, you know, we, we, I, 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 I'm also great if one has really put the time in and separated themselves. And we'll find out once we hit the field. What's your, what's your general sense on uh, the progress made via the strength and conditioning program? Well, I think, uh, you know, I think they've done a great job. I think Nick uh, Savage does a great job. And, and because it goes beyond just the, the physicality, you know, I mean, uh, I, I mean, a lot of time, if I, if I hand you a sheet, you know, follow this sheet, right? You know, you're, you can get bigger, faster, and stronger if you follow the sheet and you do the workout every single day. Um, I think he's done a great job. The team building, the, the mindset, the competitiveness, uh, you know, keep making sure the guys have an edge. And, I, you know, that's one of the things that, that I want to see carry over now into training camp is let's take, take that edge that we've learned in the weight room, uh, the mental toughness aspect of our off-season program, and incorporate that into the practice on the field. And then hopefully the confidence we have from the mental toughness we got in the off-season program, the mental toughness we got through training camp, translate into mental toughness out here on a Saturday uh, on, in the fall. Hey, Dan, what's your take on how uh, recruiting has gone for this particular cycle, the 2019 class? Uh, has it been harder for you, difficult uh, to make inroads with kids that you may have not necessarily recruited in the past? No, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of excitement around our program, not just in uh, for this recruiting class, but for the future recruiting classes. I think there is a lot of excitement about our program and the future that it's, uh, that it's headed. Um, and, you know, I... I I think it's something that's going to continue to build when they see that how we play on on Saturdays, the type of offense and defense that we played. That uh, you know, there's there's probably a lot of kids that haven't seen our offense before, you know, but they know um, 
they know what the Gator Standard is, and they know what it is. They know the academics. They know the history. They know the tradition. They know, uh, they know all about the swamp, and then they want to see what, what, what our team, offense, defense, special teams, is going to look like. So, um, you know, I, I feel, I feel uh, pretty good with the, uh, the excitement around our program. Obviously, you weren't here last year, but the defense had one of its worst years in a long, long time. What gives you confidence that the defense can rebound? Uh, well, I know, I mean, I, I think we have one excellent defensive coaches that are going to uh, really work to put those guys in a position to be successful. Uh, you know, that uh, they're, the great thing, I think, with Todd and with the coaches we have is, is the flexibility they have to uh, adapt to the players that we're going to put out there on the field. Uh, we have a young defense coming into this year, but the great thing is we also have guys that have played, so they have some experience. We have some guys that have been out there on the field and, and um, you know, and, and played in games and played in, in some bigger games and some tough environments. So I think that the, the confidence that they're going to get from being put in a position to be successful by the staff, uh, as well as the experience that they've been out there and played before, and a lot of guys have made plays before, um, I, I think that that's going to give us the opportunity to get the, the defense back uh, to where we expect it to be, um, which if, if, if you know me through the years, you know I'm in our plan to win, play great defense is number one. And uh, that, that is, that's, that's what the program's going to be based on. I know we want to score points, and I love scoring points. I love the offense. But to be a championship-level team, you have to play great defense, and that's something that w we're going to do. Dan, uh, your first press conference, you listed about four or five attributes that quarterbacks who play for you need to have. Mm -hmm. Does Philippe have all those? And if not, how close is he to having what you require out of your guy? I think they're working at it. I think he, he's learning that. I don't know that he was exposed to it before. When you get to mental, physical toughness, being number one at the quarterback position. Uh, not, not just Philippe, I think all of I've, I've seen that out of him. You know, mental physical toughness, number one. Leadership, too. I've seen that. Anytime that, you know, I've, we've gone all through the offseason to the workouts, boy, you, you see the quarterbacks out in front uh, of the workout. Uh, and, you know, because leadership goes different ways. And, and I've talked to him, explained this to him. you got to grow into that leadership. Not everyone is going to be the most vocal leader out there. Not everyone is just, you know, pure charisma, uh, you know, where everybody wants to be around them all the time. Uh, but there's lots of different ways you can lead, and by example, and how you set that standard of, of your performance every single day and the work you put in, uh, you can also lead that way. And so I, I've seen uh, from Felipe him try to do. I've seen Kyle. I mean, Emery's learning it as a new guy, just you know, trying to be in college for the first time, even to get to know all the guys on the team. Um, but the one thing I have liked is that when you, you go to workouts, they're always in front. You know, they're the ones sprinting to the front of the line. They're the ones always trying to be first. Uh, and, and that's the mindset that you have to have. Uh, I want to see them also, though, grow into the vocal leaders of, of being able to stand up, you know, to the team and, and talk to the team uh, when they need to. And I think that comes with time when they get more comfortable. I think they're comfortable on the one end. They're learning to be more comfortable on the other end of leadership. Well, he has, a he has a tremendous skill set, you know. He has the ability to make big plays. Um, you know, he has great athletic ability, has a really strong arm. So, you know, but one, one of the great things, you know, it, and this comes from time, too, because you're a young player. Uh, I remember, I'll tell you, the, the advice I talked to Dak Prescott between his junior and senior year, we had, we had a big talk about making a – making non-spectacular plays, right? We know you have the ability to make spectacular plays. Can you make the non-spectacular play? When you're watching, be like, okay, drops, you know, they, whoever are the quarterbacks, he drops back to pass, he looks, looks, hey, checks it down in the flat, gain of six yards, second down and four. That's a spectacular play in my mind, right? Because he probably got to the, possibly the third or even fourth progression in his read. He managed the game. The shot wasn't there. Next look wasn't there. Check it down. Second down and four. Great situation. Okay? Where a young quarterback thinks a spectacular play, as you said, is, you know, I can throw the ball 75 yards in the air for a touchdown. That's, that, that's a spectacular play, too. 
80-yard runs, a spectacular play too. But learning how to make the non-spectacular plays and making them every single snap with consistency uh, is really a huge trait for a quarterback. So uh, does Felipe have the skill set to do it? Absolutely, because he can make spectacular plays. Can he make non-spectacular plays on a consistent basis is going to be a big growing curve for him moving forward. Coach, do you have a uh, policy for your players owning guns or uh – yeah, well, you know what? One with? of the things we talk about, um, we do it. Like, I, I have a, I have a, a no weapons policy, but I, I think they're like, I, it's, it's not like you're not allowed to have a gun. Uh, you know, I mean, we live in a country where you, that, that's that's one of your rights, and uh, I'm, I'm, a lot of people I know have guns in their house to protect their homes and their family. What we do is spend a lot of time with the no weapons. Really, is to educate them um, on weapons, on having guns, and. Uh, why would you have it? What's the purpose of having it? Uh, to me, the, one of the biggest concerns with a lot of young people today uh, is if you're going to have a gun, make sure you're properly trained in knowing how to use it. Uh, you know, and that, that's one discussion that we've had of, of potentially, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't set this up and, and uh, as we're getting things going is if you think you need to have a gun for home security, are you trained in using it? You know, is it a legal gun? Do you have a license? You you qualified, uh, and are you trained in using it? So that what we're not looking for, uh, to me, is gun accidents or or issues where a gun could maybe cause a bigger problem than um, if there wasn't a, a weapon involved. Um, so it's really, to me, there are no weapons policies. about the education. It's when and where would be the appropriate times to have it. Um, you know, it's something I learned because, uh, you know, a long time ago, hey, we have a no weapons policy. Okay, well, I, I came from a place in Mississippi State for the last nine years where a lot of our kids, they have all kinds. They, they have bows. Um, they spend a lot of time hunting in trees and deer hunting and, and different things. So... Um, of, of, you know, how you define a weapons policy, which is to make sure we're, we're properly educating uh, our young men about having a gun or any sort of a weapon. So it's, so it's not really a no weapons policy? No, I mean, I'm not. We, you know what? I mean, I, that, that'd be a hard one uh, in the it, world. You said you have a no weapons policy? I have no weapons policy, and it's a no weapons policy in certain situations of how to be educated to not have it. If, if I wrote up the whole, like, you know, when, when I like our kids thinking, I like them thinking in quick things, uh, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? No weapons. That's easy to remember. Okay? If I write out all the different, you know, no weapons in these situations or have a weapon for a hunting situation, if I'm doing this, I store it at this location, I keep it here, I have gun safety rules and knowledge, that's not as a quick catch to them to register in their mind. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, you talk a lot about the Gator standard, living up to the Gator standard. You mentioned in your introductory press conference, you talk about it a lot. When players don't live up to the Gator standard, mm -hmm. how important is it for you in your first year to set a tone that this won't be tolerated? It's, it's huge. But it, it, it's more important to educate not just the individual, but the team on situations that occur. Um, on what happens um, and how to educate themselves and how to live up to that standard. Uh, there's, you know, I mean, it, when you sit with these young men, there, there's a lot of things in life that, that uh, you know, that I learned a long time ago that, boy, this might be really normal, common knowledge to me, and it's not to them. It, it, everyone learns. Everyone has a different background. Everybody's come from different backgrounds. Uh, uh, a lot of guys, the, everyone processes things differently and how they view things. Everyone has different personality tests. You know, we, uh, we've done studies, and I, I've done it with the team and our coaching staff with personality tests. We found out what your personality trait. How do you plan a party? And I've done that. that we did that test with, uh, with the team. And, and I'm looking at some of the guys. And I'm like, how, how did that even come across your mind? So one of the things we do is try to learn as much as we can about our players. And when they're not living up to that standard, Make sure we educate not just the individual but the entire team on this is not what's uh, this does not live up to the standards and expectations of our program in representing what the University of Florida football program is going to be all about, um, and this is how we want to try to correct or change that behavior 
to help you in the, and help the team and improve in the future. Uh, Dan, you discussed your defensive coaches earlier. What, what in particular makes Todd Grantham unique in terms of, you know, some of the other defensive coordinators that you've worked with? Well, I, I think, you know, there's several things. One, I mean, he, he's extremely passionate, um, you know, has great intensity uh, out there on the field. And, and I love, you know, I want a defense that's got a little edge to him and plays with a certain bit of intensity. Uh, and he brings that to the table every day. Um, you know, uh, He's got great experience as a coach, having coached both in, in you know, at, at the highest level of college and in the highest level of the NFL uh, on the defensive side of the ball of how to relate to the players and, and push them to get the best out of the players and motivate them to get the most out of them. You know, and as a defensive coach, I, he has a tremendous knowledge front to back. Uh, you know, he's not a guy that is, hey, he, he's, uh, you know, he's a coordinator that's really knowledgeable at the front seven and the, the secondary guy kind of take care of the back end or he's he's really knowledgeable on the back end and we have a d-line guy that kind of runs the front um you know he's a guy that can talk football at an extremely high level and know every detail uh, of the the game um from front all the way to back and uh i, I think that's what really makes him a special football coach is his knowledge front to back of the whole the whole defense and the system dan we talked a lot about discipline and guns and all this stuff and the challenges on the field. Is there any one of those areas that's more concerning for you right now, these days? You know what? No, all, every day, all of them are. You know, every day, um, a, a lot of the things we get talked to our guys constantly is the decision-making process. Because that, that can help in, I mean, most discipline issues occur because someone made a poor decision. And it doesn't matter. You, you can doesn't matter what, what form it is, whether, whether you're talking about uh, if, if someone stole someone, I mean, if you're talking about a, a, a decision with a female, if you're talking about a decision involving drugs or alcohol, you're talking a decision with a weapon, it, someone made a poor decision along the way. So it, it's a constant education process on making good decisions. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's something we, we, we talk about the guys. It's not something that happens overnight. Uh, I, I mean, ask yourself that question. I mean, I'm, I'm 46, and I, I, I'm like, okay, did I make good decisions today? And, uh, you know, um, okay, how can, I, how can I find a way, in, if I'm uh, faced with this situation in, in, again, how do I make a better decision? You know, I, I try to reflect all the time. I've been a head coach now going into my 10th year, okay? If I've been handed a situation, how did I deal with it? Did I make a decision the right way? Did I handle it the best way? And how could I have made a better decision for what happened, and if I'm if I have that if it, the situation presents itself again, I'm prepared to make a better decision even the next time. And uh, so we we talk to our guys about that that I don't expect it. It's not not something that just happens like that. That you're a perfect decision maker. Um, just talk about them and educate them on how to do that. Yeah, Dan, you have some key players returning from some pretty severe injuries. Yeah. What is going to be the availability of C.C. Jefferson, Malik Davis, Brett Hagee during camp or limitations or anything like we that? Have, we have. We expect talking to the trainers. Everyone's going to participate in practice. You know, we'll have some guys that might not still be at 100%. Uh, you know, have some maybe some non-contact jerseys on if uh, you all come out to practice tomorrow to see that. Uh, but – Everyone's uh, participating. We have anybody that's not medically cleared to participate at practice. The, the other question is, how, how would you just describe a Dan Mullen camp? I mean, what is, what's it like? Um, it has several different phases of what we're trying to build for the team. One, we want to be the, uh, we want to build a little bit of the edge. To, well, we, well, first, we've got to have great technical football, understand the offense, defense, and kicking game schemes. Uh, but... I also want to make sure that we have we are the hardest playing team in the country. Uh, that you know what we put in the work every single day. That we build mental toughness out there on the field, uh, so that when you come out of training camp, when you line up on a Saturday, you look across that field, uh, and you're going to be able to say that, hey, I can't tell whether they, you know they might be bigger, faster, stronger. They might be able to throw the ball further than we can, or 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 those things. But I'm going to tell you, they didn't outwork us leading into this football season and have that confidence on the sidelines. And that's something that we build during training camp, that mindset and that toughness that gets developed over the next 25 practices before we play a game. 
Hey, Dan. Um, obviously, this is not your first head coaching gig, but it's a new team, new kids. So when you approach camp and you start it, how quickly do you put things in your schemes, et cetera? How will you approach that? Very, very quickly, because I, I know what my expectations are. I, I think one of the things I have to be careful of, um, in, and I keep going through it, like, you know, to be honest with you, like uh, I, I talked to, to John Clark about 10 times a day, um, our, our director of operations, like, okay, what are we missing? What haven't I told somebody? Because there are new faces. There's new faces in um, – on the field with the players, there's new faces on the coaching staff, there's new faces on the administrative side and the athletic training staff of, you know, what are things that I expect, you know, I just assume everybody already knows that I haven't covered where I'm going to get out there and be like, why is this not done this way? You know, and, and that's my responsibility to make sure we've covered every single one of those. So, but we're going to put everything in. I mean, I, we're not going to slow down. We're going to have our, our, our foot on the gas. Uh, and run the training camp I expect us to run. And, um, you know, I, I know where my level of training camp and my expectations are. I'm not going to lower that. I'm just going to make sure everybody gets up to my level. And um, the faster they do, the more successful we'll be. Uh, Coach, what's your reaction to Kadarius Tony's response to saying, you know, I need an AR-15 for protection from locals? Uh, that's education. You know, I mean, that's education. You know, I, I spent a lot of time with them. And, you know, I, I think it goes more into the, uh, one statement. Anytime I look at a situation, I dive deep into it. You know, dive deep into the background. Dive deep into where you're from, where you've grown up, what your neighborhood are like, what you've been exposed to in life. Um, all of those different situations. So one of the things to me is, okay, why do you say that? Why do you think that? Is there a reality in that? Um, and how do we how do we educate you um, to make good decisions in those things? You know, I mean, there. Uh, anytime you deal with that, of how to educate guys on making those decisions, and but I don't. Very rarely do I take one quote or, or one one line and make a decision or a judgment over that whole situation without researching all the background that goes into the, what happened or or that individual's background of how, why they think that way um, and, and how to help them possibly change the way they view things. Coach, you touched on the confrontation between the locals and your players, but are you at all concerned with the fact that your players are associating with someone that at least one of them has named as a gambler going so far as to say that they were friends until the Gators started losing? Does that concern you? Uh, no, it's something we, we'd look into right there. Um, I'll be honest with you. I mean, they just made sports gambling legal across America, so there's obviously a lot of gamblers in the United States and America. There might, might, I don't. There might be a bunch in this room right here, and I'm associating with you today. So, um, you know, uh, in, in terms of that, again, that would be something we'd investigate or look into uh, in, in severity of it. But, um, you know, I, we're always concerned. Uh, for our players of who they associate with in every aspect of their life. I think that's, you know, uh, I hear a lot of successful people tell you, you want, you want to judge a successful person, show me their friends. I'll tell you how successful it is by their friends, who they associate, who they hang out with. Um, another educational part for our program and for our young men of making sure who you are associating yourself, who you're hanging around with, uh, and are those people that are bettering your life or making you a better person. With all due respect, I mean, you know, people in here might be gambling, but these are players dealing directly with someone who they say was gambling. Have you looked into it? Oh, yeah, we're, we look into everything. And what did you find? When we, if we find something, we'll, we'll let you know. I know you said everyone on the roster will be available uh, for camp when it opens. Can you give an update on Kavanis Davis and his, and his yeah, condition okay. going forward? Uh, Kavana, both uh, both Kavanis Davis and uh, Justin Watkins are no longer with our program. Uh, they've moved on from our program, so they won't be with here with us anymore. Hey, Dan, there was also, in, with that report, there was a line in the, one of the police reports saying that the Scambler had also uh, provided discounts to players for cars. What was your, your reaction to that? Has that been, um, is compliance looking into that? Absolutely. That's some, anytime we hear, no matter who a source is or credibility of sources even, I, what we'll do anytime, anytime we hear any of those things, we look into all of that. You know, uh, you know, Jamie McCluskey does a great job. Our compliance department, our administration does a great job. Uh, I, 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 
you know, those things happen probably more often maybe than people even think they happen, that we, as soon as we hear about something, we go through the channels, we report it, uh, and our compliance office immediately begins to look into situations to see uh, what happened. Yeah, back to Coach Meyer for a minute. Mm -hmm. Just how sad are you that it's come to this for him? Uh, I think you knew Zach Smith. You might have even coached him at some point that this is – that this situation has, I mean, how sad is that for you knowing those two guys? Well, I, I, obviously as coaches, you know, anybody that you're close with that goes through a difficult situation, it's all, always tough. You know, I mean, people that, that you're friends and you're close with uh, in life, uh, anytime they're dealing with a, a situation and, and the situation Urban's dealing with, it, it, it's always hard. You always keep them in your prayers and, uh, you know, you hope things work out the best for them because, I mean, they're, they're people that uh, have had, had influences on you throughout your life. Dan, uh, this, this football program has scored average 30 points a game one time in the last seven years. Uh, a lot of years, one year there was under 20, another year 22, 23. Do you have any kind of floor for what you would expect your offense in terms <laughs> of scoring? Because certainly this is uh, something that is very much on the minds of your uh, fans. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know that I have a floor, but I also don't have a ceiling. How's that? Uh, you know, I, one of the things that we're going to look at is, as the team goes, um, and, and I've been involved in it, and I've, I've learned this through the years, you know, um, despite being an offensive-oriented coach throughout the majority of my career as a head coach, what's most important to me is winning the game. And I love – Trust me, I love scoring points. I love putting up big numbers. I, I want to be, like, you know, off the chart number-wise uh, offensively. But I also the reason I don't put a, a floor or a ceiling is the most important scoring number, right, is the number one, that we score at least one more point than whoever we're playing on that day. Uh, I learned that a long time ago, and, and you know, uh, even as a young coach, I, I learned it one day actually in this stadium uh, on the visiting sidelines where a lot of people said, boy, came in, we took a, you had a quick lead. Then you, I think we ran the ball 42 consecutive plays. Because so by throwing the ball was the best opportunity for the other team to score, was to intercept it and run it back for a touchdown. It was our mind. We had a very good defense. Uh, they had a very good secondary. And uh, so we ran it 42 consecutive plays. Probably not the most exciting for the fans in the stadium or any of that. And I think walked away with a 10-7 victory. But I'll tell you what, that celebration in the locker room was pretty sweet. <laughs> Lots of points. Yeah. Yes. I, it's hard to say shocking because I wasn't here. And, and you know what, to be honest, the, the funny thing is, since... Um, I never got to see Florida much. We had, we had, you know, when I, when I was in Mississippi, I played, hadn't played him since uh, 2010 was the last time we played. Uh, and, you know, and so we never saw him in lots of crossovers. For whatever, how the schedule would fall, you'd see him maybe once or twice a year on a crossover. So I never really got to see him play much. So it It would be shock. I'm sure the fan base. I mean, I, I as as a a Gator fan and knowing how our fan base is, that's very shocking. Uh, as a coach, not being here and not knowing again what what individual strategy or how each team plays out, it, it's hard to be critical because I don't know what the the goals or the accomplishments were, or what they were trying to do in a given game. You know, I like I've said I, offensively in coach, I think I've been on teams that had successful seasons that were first in time of possession and last in time of possession. Teams that were near the top in passing and near the bottom in passing still had successful seasons. Teams that were near the top in rushing and near the bottom in rushing. Teams that scored a lot of points uh, and won games. And then teams that we've had to play ball control, battle it out, and win close games and not be a high-scoring offense. Um, you, you really have to build it around the team that you have, and that, that's what we'll do as a staff. I, you know, it's not – I don't view the team as offense and defense as separate entities. I view us as one team that – 
Uh, if the defense gives up 40, we need to score 41, right? If the give, defense gives up six, we need to score seven. And, you know, um, don't get me wrong, I'm not against. If the defense gives up three and we score 60, I have no problem with that either. Uh, on offense, too, right? Like the offense divas. So when I go back and forth, I'm sitting there with we in the, in the offensive room. We're meeting. We want to put a bunch of points on the board. We also want to go talk to the defense, and they might say, hey, you know, we, we, we're going to need some ball control here. We're going to need to use the clock. I mean, I love Todd Grantham gives me always these great lines. He's like, hey, he'll click over. He's like, hey, you think you could get one of those 14 play drives you usually you sometimes put together here? I'm like, well, if I could just dial them up at any time, I'd, we'd have no problems ever. But, um, but, you know, we're always in communication, working together as a full team, more than worried about just statistics on one side of the ball or the other. Thank you all. Have a great day. We'll see you all at practice tomorrow. Yeah, we'll see you all at practice tomorrow. Have a great day. Go Gators. Jerry and right. Hey, Coach. Thank you. How are you doing? Good. I'm doing well. How are you doing? I wanted to ask uh, a question about a local kid we have in Jacksonville, Tyler Jordan. He uh, 
He's played all four of the five offensive line positions, and you're going to be, I believe, his fourth offensive line coach since he's been That's here. Nice, huh? uh, how much, how well have you gotten to know him, and uh, what are your plans for him? Because he's he's played pretty much across the board, and what kind of kid? Yeah, do you, no, have you I mean, him to be? great. He's a great kid. Just you know, obviously, in the, the seven months being here and getting to know him and trying to get them, you know, personally who they are, but also as a player and just seeing the same background and kind of figure out what they've done here. Um, and you look at Tyler right now, he's going into guard, but he's done all summer, worked, at, worked the reps at center because I think you can never have enough. Uh, you can always move guys to tackle and guard to me. They can jump them around the center position. That you, you have to do it all summer, the snaps, because it's, it's the, a huge part of it. So to me, he's working at guard, taking reps at center, just getting snaps, doing that stuff. So in case it's an emergency down the road, uh, again, I've always got prepared to have four or five of those guys ready to play at center position. Yeah, um, Don, can you, uh, how you doing? Um, first of all, Dan talked a, a lot about how the quarterbacks have to come back after the summer and, and, it, and it can't have to reteach them. They've yeah. got to remember everything. Is it similar with the offensive linemen who probably have, ha I'm guessing, have had to change their blocking? And also, how, how many are you guys are you looking to have uh, that can play? Uh, is it a, like an eight-man rotation? Or? Yeah, for, the, for me, the biggest thing, coming back to the summer, I think the, the whole thing of, you know, obviously the, the stages coming into the program compared to what it's going to be I mean, as it goes was you came in the winter and you kind of teach them, teach them what you're doing offensively, terminology, techniques, fundamentals. You go through spring and you kind of give it to them to learn. And I, I've always said it all the years of they have all the information. Now to me the summer, again, you don't get the opportunity besides the two hours a week you can kind of work with them a little bit. Um, is that's their time to now start honing those skills and master them, really come into camp now. Like I told them, there has to be a, a difference from the last day of spring to the first day of camp. Okay, we can't go back to teaching you as the first step or whether it's this. And I think that's, um, we'll, we'll see that come tomorrow of where they've gone, you know, just in meetings. I think they have a, the meetings we've had, the two hours a week, their understanding of the offense, their understanding of schemes and my terminology, uh, I think they're pretty good with. Um, again, we'll see it tomorrow live action as it gets going, but I think they've done a, they've done a good job this summer so far from what I've seen. Um, in terms of rotation, I, I usually say eight. You know, when I look at three tackles, three guards, two centers, and then one of those other ones has to be a center. You know, I think looking at can you get 15, you know, you have 15, 16 guys on scholarship, is can you have 16 ready? No. I think to, to be prepared for a game, to be very successful, we ha eight guys have to be able to play. And you got your two starting tackles. You got that third guy that's able, able to go both ways. The same thing with guards, and, and the two centers plus a third guy that can be a center. And you know the, the benefit if we get nine, we get ten. I move up with that. Terrific, you know. But to me, eight guys have to be have to have the game plan, understanding of everything going in that game for us to be successful. Graham on the line. A guy like Martez Ivy coming back for his senior season. Obviously, there are some benefits to keeping him at that left tackle position. But have there been a lot of discussions about using him all across the line? I haven't. I mean, just because I, I think, again, everyone learning for me to see and evaluate each individual for what they can do. If you start taking the Martez, for example, is, okay, let's play left here, learn this left tackle, hey, go play right guard, go play left guard. I'll never get a full evaluation of what he can do. So to me, through the winter, through the spring, through the summer, going to campus, stay where you are so I can see what you can do. And at that point, is, is someone better than him? that I can move him, but he's still, again, I look at the first top five. Who are the top five going out? The best five are going to play. Now, if they got to switch position, then we got to do that. But to me is give them a fair evaluation instead of making the mental burden on them, jumping around and saying, well, I don't know if he could do it physically because he, mentally he's not learning it. Let them learn it mentally so they can give me everything they got physically, and that will tell me everything I need to know. And, and obviously, then we can move from there. Obviously, there's been a lot made about how much depth you have on the line. Was there a point where you found yourself in spring, you know, having three – position coaches in as many years where you had to kind of break some some more bad habits than you kind of yes. anticipated? Can you go into some of those? <laughs> yeah. But, but And I hate saying they're bad habits. They're just, they're not my habits. You know what I mean? To say they are bad habits or good habits, that's, I, I'm not going to say that because I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know the guys before that, so I can't criticize what they did. That's, they, I mean, if they've worked and it's been successful to them, terrific. I say the same thing to my guys, and I tell, I tell my kids that. I say what I've taught and what I teach for all the years I've done it, it's worked for me and it's been successful. That's what I'm teaching you. To say that's obviously dead wrong, no. But what I'm going to teach is worked for me. So again, that's what we're going to we're going to go on. Because again, as 
As you learn it, you're learning what I know. I can't fix. You can try this. I tell them all the time because kids will watch NFL film. They'll watch the NFL on TV and be like, well, he's doing this, coach. Did you see this? I said, yes. And if I know what it is, I can teach and correct it. But if you're put in situations where I can't correct it because I don't teach it, what do I tell you? Well, you can do this. Well, coach, we were taught to do this. I don't understand how to get out of it. So I can teach you that what it is, but if I don't have an answer to your problem, I can't do it. So what I do, I have answers for. If it's getting a tackle, a speed rush, a bull rush, here's what I teach so I have the answers to counter what they're coming with. I can't base it off what someone else has taught you. So again, it's just learn what, what I'm teaching because that's what we're going we're gonna to go fight with. Hey, John, hey. Just, just a follow-up to that. Um, when you have guys that have been taught a certain way and then you teach them your way, have they been receptive to the change? I think they have. You know, again, early on, it's always, you know, kids are kids. They're trying to get the feelers out for how much, how much will he give and then how much will he won't give. And to me, at what point do I can, I got a break. Like I tell them, I'm, I'm getting older. I'm not that I'm not feeling that old yet, but I'm a tough one to break. And you can try. You can keep trying, but it's, we're going to see. You know, who breaks first? And I, again, over the years, I've seen a lot of things. So I say, you can keep trying, but we're going to keep going. But again, I think once you, you, again, like anything you do with the kids is you can only educate them on what's, what educate them and teach them, here's where I'm getting you. And when you say, like I answered the question of, I can't get you out of these problems if I don't know what you were taught. So learn my technique so when you get into problems, whether it's, again, pass rush or pass technique, I can teach you how to get out of it. If you're stuck in a thing that I can't, I don't have answers for, what do I tell you? I said, so that's why to me, I have answers for the things I teach. Let's learn that way so I can help you in the long run, which again, ultimately for these kids is all obviously to try to play the next level from here. So again, what's gonna help me? And I, I do a lot of comparisons with the kids, um, you know, whether it's installing plays or techniques. So here's a technique, you did it successfully. Now watch, here's the left tackle that Cowboy's doing it. Same exact thing, and it works for him. So I think when kids see that of what's, what they want to ultimately get. Here's a picture of, here's the three techniques of pass, push, pass uh, blocking we're gonna use. Here's the same three he uses. So they see, oh, crap, let me learn that. And, and it works, you know, and you can you have, obviously, things to, credibility to do it. It, it helps the kids learn it and want to learn it. How collective a decision is, is the quarterback one among the whole offensive staff? I guess there's always, everyone's, I guess everyone's entitled to their opinion, but I think it's, it's ultimately with, with Coach Mullen and Coach Johnson, see them the most. You know, again, I, I can, we'll give, everyone will give their two opinions on things and what they might see here and there. Uh, but I think obviously Brian and, and, and Coach Mullen spend the most time, 100% time with him. I see him, whether it's team periods and that stuff and film, watching film. But to me, the, all the different things that they see, they see more of it. So it's, again, everyone has a kind of say, but I think the ult obviously the ultimate decision is going to be put with, with Coach Mullen and Brian. I mean, what, what's like, what do you look for in a guy? Well, just to me, the, what I see is just, I mean, it, when it's protections, okay, and he's protections, different things in protection. I'll say, hey, he's drifting, maybe drifting to the left, and he does this better, or it's timing, or it's different things in the run game, the checks that you see. But just it's more uh, obvious things that I see than it is the little things that they're seeing every day with the meetings, the personality that I don't always see because I'm not, you know, I'm watching film of it, so you don't understand it or you don't see his facial expression because I'm watching what I'm watching. So they see everything. It's no different my guys. Of opinion, that's the obvious of what's going on in practice or on film. But to see, hey, what's, everything is, can he learn in the media? They're not, everyone's in the meeting with me, of they can learn, how they learn. So I think that's the biggest thing you got to trust. Obviously, we have, we have great coaches on the staff that um, each of them are individually in their meeting rooms with the kids. They know their kids more than I know the quarterbacks or I know the, the linebackers is, I have 24 seven with them. Trust obviously take more of my opinion, more weight in my opinion, because I see them every day and what's gonna go on. And that to me is obviously everyone sees something different. So just give their opinion so you can always look at it. Coach, uh, what are your expectations on how much Jefferson and Grimes can bring to this offense? Do you, have you seen enough on them at all in, in film study to know what they can bring? You know, obviously through spring practice, that was in practice in the, as if they were gonna play through spring practice. You see they bring a, a bunch of things to us. You know, obviously they bring depth. They bring some speed with Van. Van brings some more experience, obviously, um, with it from playing, you know, in this league for a year. So he brings that experience. But to me, I think the biggest thing right now is you bring in depth uh, at the position. You bring in, again, experience with him, and you just bring in, you know, there's different qualities they each have. But I think they both bring in, they're both very talented kids that we just got to utilize them more as we see as they go. As a follow-up, what is the number one expectation for Odell? 
I mean, for us, we always look to me to be efficient. You know, I mean, I know people want to hear, let's score 500 points. Okay, I think the biggest thing we talk about is always being efficient. Is to me in the run game, I want to be efficient four yards. We get the big plays, we get the big plays. But constantly be efficient. I mean, obviously score points, but be efficient in everything we do, whether it's in the pass game or the run game. Just constantly moving forward. Get first downs, which obviously is the touchdowns. So I think there's, for us, our goal is always we want to be efficient. Run game, we have four yards to run. You know, because that puts us in, get to four yards, you're in second, you're third and two, which, which is in a good situation on third down, what we can do. Um, the big plays are going to come, which we have, obviously, our goals offensively is to have big plays in a game. You know, to me, big plays, when you do all the studies of big plays and drives, it leads to touchdowns. So we want to be efficient. We want to have the big plays to sit there and say every play is scripted to be a big play. Absolutely not. I think I spoke at the women's clinic the other day. Obviously, they all want 100 yards. I got there was about 15 women that gave me plays that gain 80 yards every time. Give me them all. We'll put every one of them in. <laughs> I said, but it's it's unrealistic. So you have. So don't when you watch the when you're watching the game and you get four yards. And I understand my wife does the same thing to me. Well, why would you run that play when it's only getting four yards? Well, there's a reason for that, and it sets up play action, does those things. So to me, our thing is always to be efficient. That's always a each week we do that. We go through the efficiency of the stuff, and that's one of our goals. Is if we're efficient, we're getting those explosive plays we need. We'll be successful on the field in the end and have the win. John, you know from coaching this league, a quarterback is always one hit away from being injured. How much do you want your with that in mind? A quarterback is one hit away from being injured. With that in mind, uh, how much do you want your offensive line to take pass protection personally? You know, just being able to be very ability. personally. I mean, that, that's that's a that to me is that that's their job. I mean, ultimately, that's what we're they're here for. I mean, obviously, to run the ball and to protect the quarterback. That's the two things you look at. The basic things we look at. So to me, it's a, it's a huge deal. Um, and constantly evaluate that in practice with him and tell him that in practice is he can't be touched. Because he has a job to do. I mean, a quarterback has a job to do, and, and he's not, he, if he's looking at protection, if he's looking at is he going to get hit, he's not looking where he should be. Which ultimately, I tell, I tell my kids the offensive line, I tell them, listen, if, if quarterbacks throw interceptions, I'm going to tell you 79% chance it's your problem. Because he's looking at who's hitting the quarterback, who's coming, from, who's doing this, who's getting beat, and he's not spending time reading coverage, understanding what's going on. So for you, our job is to make his job very comfortable back there so he can do his job. Because if he can't do his job, then again, uh, there's nothing else we can do. I can't put an extra player to help him. I said, so we have to do our job for him. Everyone has to do their job. 11 guys on offense have to do their job, their job. No one has to do anything spectacular. Every 11 guys on that field at that time, do your job, and we will be successful. Oh, last one. Snuck it in there. There's a, there's a, the, hey, it's interesting because I haven't, I'm going to answer your first question, I haven't been around, we've had the one guy and then you've had two that's a good player and three that, okay, he's got to learn to develop, to have, you know, the number we have or it's three, four, I mean, there's a, I didn't say there's three, there's four, there's five, and there's a bunch because Malik wasn't there all spring, which I haven't really seen him live uh, besides watching film from the previous season, just uh, see how talented he is and going, okay, he wasn't even out there in the spring. <laughs> so. There's, there's a handful of now to go out there. And I think the biggest thing for us, you know, going back to earlier questions of evaluating them in spring, how good were they in the spring? I don't know because were they still the mental part of learning everything that we had to learn? So I think going back to, you know, what do they do during the summer so the mental part is not going to hamper them from being physical, you know, to being better players than they were in the spring because they've learned the offense and now they're confident in the mental part of it to be physical. I think that's the biggest thing with all the kids. You have to be mentally confident to be physically confident. You, you, I'm big and strong as you are, as fast as you are, as hard as you run. If you don't know where you're going, it doesn't help you. So to me, that'll be an intriguing thing going into camp of, you know, who's done their job in the summer, who's got better in the summer to turn it over in the fall camp. Yeah, you can. I mean, again, there's. We've got to. Ultimately, we got to look at evaluate even more through the camp early on in camp is. I mean, the more that they can play, put them on the field. Find a way to get them on the field. If we got to put three running backs on the field at once, put three running backs on the field at once. You know, if that's what you, we walk, you know, you're walking in here, if that's what you have, then you got to utilize them. And how you utilize them and what they can do is we got to, we got to put them in the right position. Last two, Edgar and then Tyson. So how, how much have you seen a change in, in the bodies, physicality, strength of, of these linemen I think since they've gotten here? You know, a great amount. Even just what I mean, 
and again, you have some time off in the summer. You don't see them every day. So when you come back, leaving them to coming back after you know a couple of weeks and seeing them during the week once or twice. Um, but you just see to me, I, one thing I noticed even as we did agilities last week with Martez, I think was the biggest thing watching him running around agility wise. He just, his body looks stronger. He looks more, he's, he's tighter in everything he's doing compared to a little looser, which again, a little weakness. But to me, there's more strength and there's more bulk on there to me to help him. Again, and he's had some injuries along the way. So to me, it's, you see the body changes, you know, now for them, I hopefully it's for them they see now going into camp, they feel what the changes they've had in the weight program. And you've worked with a lot of coaches or strength coaches, I'm sure, during your career. What What is it that makes Nick Savage stand out? I think he, the kids understand he's working for them. You know, he's putting everything into it for their benefit, their success. And I think that's all of us as, as coaches. And it's the same thing I tell you know, my players dealing with them more than anybody, is everybody that's touching you here is for your benefit. Whether it's Nick, whether it's the academics, whether it's the coaches, no matter who it is, the nutritionist, whoever it is. So you see, and again, for them, I think the biggest thing they see in the weight program is, and they do a good job, they take the pictures of them. You know, I think there's a picture of CC when he, in January, there's a picture of CC in the end of spring. As you see the picture of just his body. <laughs> you say, okay, buy into what we're telling you nutrition wise, weight room wise, lifting, conditioning, all those things, you see your body change. And that's for the biggest, the biggest thing for those kids are they see it. They see, you know, football wise and teaching them that, they still gotta see that coming up in August. That weight room is a very quick, visible picture of, here's what I looked like then, Here's what I look like now. I, mean, we all, I wish I could be like 180 pounds. But here's your before and after pictures. That's all I need to see, and it works. So that to me, is already building them confidence in themselves of what they can do. Pat on the left, and then Nick's coming. John, um, obviously, uh, this was a staff, this was a offensive line that last year was being touted before the season and did not play very well. Do you sense a, a hunger that they were they felt embarrassed by that, and that with again for eight years, Florida's offense has not been very good. Yeah, I mean, I think they, I mean, listen to, listen to him. I think last week they had their, their, the last lift and you heard a lot of them. Um, and Martez was just, you know, Martez is the one I think I've seen and heard the most of. He's taken the most leadership to that, that they, he hasn't lived up to, they haven't lived up to expectations of what is expected of them. And that's all you mean. It's, keep talking about that is Woody and Martez and Fred and Tyler in the last year here. And I think I told them, where do you want to go? I mean, you look at the group that went out last year, I said, whatever expectations they had, I said, did they fulfill it? I said, this is your last go around. Are you fulfilling it? Not only beside, be, don't be selfish for yourself, as for me, it's the whole group. Okay, you have to take ownership and leadership. I think that's the biggest thing. You, that's the biggest thing that's got better, um, probably from about April to now, is them taking ownership instead of being very. Oh, it's about me. I got to get stronger. I got to get better. I got to learn it. To where I force them to put it on Martez. You're responsible for T.J. Moore or Stone. It's on you. They listen to me so much. Peer pressure is harder than anything. So to me, they hear from you. You're the senior. You push them. Fred, you have to push them. Tyler, you have to push them. You can't be about yourself. And as a group, collectively, we gotta, we're going to go as five. So to me, you can do. You can grade out 100 percent. The guy next to you doesn't. We lose. I said. So it's your responsibility to make sure he's holding his, up his end of the bargain, too. And that's what you got to push the guys behind him because again, something's going to happen where. Shoes, shoelace is going to break. Someone else has to come in. Are you prepared for him to go in the game? Did you make sure you pushed him hard enough, whether it's practice, whether it's medium, whether it's film study, to me helping them become better players, which will ultimately help you become a better player and help you get to what you want? Good afternoon. We'll start. Um, glad everyone's here. So I'll just open it up to questions and get rolling. Yes, sir. Coach, your, your third down defense, three of the last four years, is 10th in the country. I'm just mm -hmm. curious about your approach on third down and how that's evolved over time. Yeah, well, well, first of all, I think you have to spend a lot of time on it from a third down perspective. And you have to understand that, that third down is a possession down. Uh, so there's a sticks element involved to the down, meaning, you know, third and three to six, there's going to be different routes, different protections relative to, say, third and seven to eight, nine to ten, 
and then obviously you got third and say 13 or more. So um, it's important that you kind of work that situation with guys to understand that um, uh, here are the things coming relative to the down and distance. And then the next thing is, is, is having the ability to rush the passer and play tight coverage. Um, you know, we're more of a um, pattern match zone defense. So even though sometimes it looks like it's man to man, it's actually zone. I think that allows you to play tighter coverage, which forces the quarterbacks to make more accurate throws. Uh, and that can, uh, that can help your rush and also your turnovers. Do you think it's something you've got a better feel over time, you know, compared to when you started as a defensive coordinator? Oh, I don't think there's any doubt year one to now you would be better. Uh, I think as a coach, you're always evolving to become a better coach. So um, I would say the answer to that is, is hopefully we're, we're better, you know, I'm a better coach this year than I was last year or three years ago. Because you're always working to, you have to stay on track with things that are happening. You know, the offenses evolve, things change. <clears throat> People may attack you a different way relative to what they see. So you've always got to be, in my opinion, working the game to, to be the best coach you can be. Hey, Todd, what's the progress that you saw since you arrived from uh, T.J. Slayton, and what are your expectations for him in this defense? Yeah, you know, T.J.'s a little bit like our guys up front. We have some young players up front. Uh, T.J. has – the, the size and measurables you look for in dominant linemen. Uh, he's a guy that can, can do a couple things. Number one, in the run game, he can hold a point. Um, he can command double teams. He should win the one-on-one -on -one blocks. Um, he also has the athletic ability that he can have range to the ball at, you know, on the runs. And then when you get to the pass, because of his movement on the edge as well as his ability to collapse the pocket, I think a guy like TJ would go well with – you know, Zaninga, CC, Polite, those guys coming off the edge because now the quarterback cannot step up in the pocket. Because the biggest thing with pass rush is your ability to collapse the pocket outside in. And, and a guy like TJ with his ability inside can do what we call push the pocket. He's got a guy, Kerry Clark, who obviously he can kind of mm -hmm. can groom him somewhat. Do you see foresee a scenario where they, two, they could be in a game at the same time? Absolutely. I think it's important that up front you cross train your guys because you have to play a lot of guys up front. Um, and the more things that they can do, uh, the more flexibility you have. So as we go through training camp, like, for example, the way training camp is now, you know, the first, the first third of it is really evaluating players, kind of like spring practice, but also trying to cross-train guys to play more than one position to just give you that flexibility based upon rotation or injury. Coach, can you talk about uh, C.C. Jefferson, how he's going to fit into your defense? Uh, is he going to be yeah. kind of standing up, putting his hand on the ground? I mean, so, so we're, 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 we're a three-four structure. But at the end of the day, we play three down, four down. Um, with that, C.C. is really an end-of-the-line player for us. Um, so a lot of the characteristics or skill sets that he's had to use in the past, uh, he'll continue to use. Uh, we'll, we'll just develop him more as an end-of-the-line player, as a linebacker, and doing those things, which will be a little bit of coverage, um, not as much as other backers. Uh, but CeCe's really embraced the change. I think when you look at his body type, he's made to be more of a linebacker at the next level as opposed to a defensive end. And with this, it's going to allow him to play in a system that allows him to utilize his skill set and the things he does best. The thing about CeCe is... He, he plays the game really hard. Uh, he has a passion for the game. And, you know, with his continued development and improvement um, in his techniques, we fully expect him to have a big year. What potential do you see in the two sophomore corners? Yeah, I think with those two guys, um, first of all, you look at their measurables as far as their length, their, their change of direction, their speed. Those are things you really like. Uh, I think anytime guys outside have the ability to play tight man coverage and play guys one-on-one, -on -one, it can give you flexibility to maybe free up and double someone else or create a five-man rush where you're basically playing man-free with a post guy. So I think when you have the ability to cover outside one-on-one, -on -one, um, it gives you flexibility within your system. And, and Chauncey, what do you like about him at the next Chauncey, position? Yeah, Chauncey loves football. I mean, Cha Chauncey is a guy that I consider one of the leaders of our defense. Um, he's always working the game. He's always wanting to improve, ask questions. Um, he is a guy that's kind of a – he really can play corner. He could play safety. He's kind of played all over. As a nickel, you kind of do both. 
and you have that flexibility. Sometimes things happen a little quicker as an inside defender as opposed to outside. So with his passion, he has developed a little bit of instinct for how those things can come, and he's done a good job with that. And, and really, he's a guy that will continue to develop at, at, our, at our nickel back to give us the flexibility to, say, cover that guy. Because, it's you know, like we were talking about on third down, on third down, that guy has to have the ability to cover. The thing you like, and with CeCe's play strength, is you also get a blitzer. You know, if you're blitzing that guy, you, you got to be able to win on backs. And, and, you know, with his play strength and his size and speed, I think he's a guy that can do all of that. A lot has been made about Florida's drop off on defense last year, but one of the bright spots was their third down mm -hmm. conversion percentage. Mm -hmm. Where did that third and Grantham nickname come from, and what is your mentality going into third down? <laughs> uh, first of all, I'm not sure where it came from. I mean, um, you'd have to, I guess, research that. I think the biggest thing is, is, is systematically we've all we've been good on third down, uh, and you're good on third down when you have guys that can rush and guys that can cover. And I think that with the guys that we have here, I fully expect us to continue to be good. Obviously, you weren't here last year, but you know that this defense struggled and had one of its worst years in a long time. What gives you confidence, as kind of big picture, that this can be a, a championship-level defense that you all want? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm not really concerned about what happened last year. I'm more concerned about moving forward. Uh, and the only thing I can grade guys on is what I see. And since we've been here in January, the guys have really embraced the changes and the things that we have asked them to do from a strength conditioning standpoint, from an effort standpoint. You know, the biggest thing we always talk about on defense is playing to our identity, which we say is fast, physical, and aggressive. And, and really, you know, coaching is a part of developing that identity, you know, because really it gets down to habits. Um, I've been very pleased with our guys, and we're not where we need to be yet. But our guys have embraced trying to develop the habits we need to be that kind of defense. Because if you do play to that identity, um, you have a good chance to win the game. Um, you know, we always talk to our guys about competitive toughness. Uh, we always give them a CT grade. In other words, every day we give them a CT grade on their competitive toughness in practice. And if you can develop that mindset of having to play to that identity with competitive toughness, I mean, you have a chance to be a good defense and be hard to score on and create turnovers. And if you do that, you got a chance to be in every game. Hey, Coach, right here. Hey. Speaking of grades, actually, we've seen several Florida defenders like Marco, CJ, David Reese pop up on these analytic sites over the offseason for how they grade it out. Mm -hmm. As those analytics become more and more ingrained in the game, are you able to use them yourself and for your advantage for I mean, your own team or opponent? Yeah, I mean, we have internally, we have things that we evaluate. I mean, we do a self-scout on our defense structurally. Um, we can also do it individually on players as far as, you know, allowed completions, um, past, you know, past, past affected, you know, things like that, batted balls. Um, I, I think the biggest thing comes from watching guys in practice and, and watching how they play. Then you get into the games, it's all about matchups, you know, relative to the people you're playing and what they're trying to do. So we're always going to try to work to, you know, take away the best players that we face and uh, force the team to beat you left-handed. So really, um, you know, you kind of rank your guys, and then from that ranking, you try to find ways to match your players up against theirs. Mm -hmm. I know it may be a little early to assess, but how much pressure would you like to bring this season? Um, well, the biggest thing you want to do on defense is, first of all, you don't want to let people run the ball, okay? Because once you make them one-dimensional, it dictates a little bit better for how you can play. And then once that happens, you want to find ways to make the quarterback play bad. I mean, it's as simple as that. How can we make this guy play bad? Um, so as far as pressure, I mean, you always want to try to put the quarterback under duress. I mean, just because you're bringing, you play with 11 guys, okay? So when you rush four, you're in a four-man rush with seven guys covering. Well, just because you bring a DB doesn't mean you can't play the same coverage. In other words, it gets into what we call a zone replacement from that standpoint. So just because you have the illusion that a guy's coming doesn't mean it's always man-to-man -man because at the end of the day, you could bring, be in four, you could bring five, or you could bring six. So that part of it is really game by game relative to the matchups and how you feel about how you can affect the quarterback. 
Coach, you've got a guy in T.J. Slayton who's really impressive, honestly. Big, <clears throat> strong, got a lot of experience last year. Mm -hmm. Do your eyes light up when you think about the potential he could possibly have for this team? Yeah, I think that just like what I was talking a minute ago about T.J., T.J.'s a young player that has embraced the things we've asked him to do. He's obviously a talented guy that can play multiple things for us. Um, he's what I consider a three-down player from the sense that he has the ability to stop the run on early downs, first and second, but he also has some pass rush ability, ability to push the pocket and give you those things in the past. So from that standpoint, we'll just continue to work him with our other guys to uh, create a rotation where those guys can play to the identity that we want them to play with. Uh, Coach, where does Adam Schuler look to fit into this defense? Yeah, I mean, Adam's a guy that we're really excited about being here. Um, He's a guy that could play multiple positions for us. He could play in, he could play tackle. Uh, so what we'll do is, is we'll continue to evaluate him, uh, get him up to speed on, on those positions, and really just let him, you know, learn our system and then get a rotation going. To me, uh, he's a talented player that has, has starts um, at this level and will give us added depth, um, you know, in a very competitive conference. The, the linebackers, how, how would you assess just their the, the playmaking ability there? David Reese made a ton of plays between the tackles. He said mm -hmm. at Media Day in Atlanta he wants to expand his game. Mm -hmm. What do you see with him and just the group? I think David's a guy that um, has all the intangibles you look for in a player. He's obviously the quarterback of the defense, can be a settling effect to other players because of the way he makes calls and communicates. So that part of it's really a positive. He, he was a very productive player for them last year, and you can see why based upon the tape and the things he's done in the spring, and we'll continue to develop him. Uh, Voshan jo Joseph is a guy that when you talk about the linebackers inside, um, he's got really good athletic ability. He's got ability to play in space and do those kind of things which you need because of the, the spread formations and things like that. And then honestly, behind them, we got a bunch of guys that we're gonna continue to work and develop. We got young guys coming in like David Reese also, the young David Reese, and we'll really continue to try to develop all those guys inside to give us a rotation that allows us to maybe free some guys up to not play as many snaps uh, to keep guys fresh. And then when you look outside, you know, obviously you got CC, you got Ja'Kai, uh, Jeremiah Moon. I mean, those guys honestly can play either outside backer position, and they will learn to play both just to give you the flexibility to be able to have two of those three guys on the field, you know, as we move forward. Yeah, so Colin's a guy that can play either Mike, what we call um, Mike or Mo or Mac and Money. It's an inside backer position. He can play either one. He does bring a physical presence when he's in there. Um, he has good play instincts, and he'll certainly be in the, um, he'll be in a competition. And that's the good thing when you look at our team. I think there's going to be a lot of competition on our team. And that'll be one of the battles that we'll let guys compete to make plays and, and earn the right to play. All right, thank you.